we have three papers. We have uh, uh, three papers and we have 120 minutes. And uh, our own paper, which comes at the end, is sort of, it went down to the wire. Um, we wouldn't have been able to share anything with the discussants because it, we, we just got the paper ready and there is no discussant, which is why we have decided to allocate five extra minutes to both of the other per, uh, presenters. Um, and so we have 45, 45 and 35. Uh, and the, the, that's to be split for the first two into 30 minutes presentation, 10 minutes discussion, and five minutes wiggle room uh, plus uh, Q&A. Um, so uh, Massimo, I think you're first. Are you ready to go? Very ready. So let me uh, bring my slides up um, and we can start. Thank you for the introduction and for uh, uh, allowing us to present our work here. Now my slide should be up, um, and uh, uh, with uh, no further delay, uh, uh, I think I should start. Uh, so again, uh, let, let me thank uh, again the organizers uh, for accepting our paper. Um, uh, this paper is a joint work with uh, Arnaud and, and Libio, uh, who also work at the European Central Bank. And the usual disclaimer applies is our, our, our own views and they do not represent the views of the ECB or, or the euro system in any way. Uh, so let me just uh, jump start into the topic. Um, since I'm also the first presenter, uh, probably uh, I should also give a bit of an overview of uh, um, what we intend with uh, central bank digital currencies. Maybe someone in the audience is not so familiar with the topic. Essentially, uh, a central bank digital currency is a liability of the central bank, uh, much like cash and uh, uh, deposits, uh, which are uh, available uh, for uh, private banks, uh, but kinds of uh, shares uh, this, uh, the characteristic of, this, of these two instruments, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it should be meant to be uh, widely available, so available also to the general public, not only financial institutions, uh, but differently from cash, it's essentially digital in nature. So it's a digital instrument that this brings uh, all possible features uh, into the uh, instruments um, uh, due to its uh, uh, digital, uh, digital uh, nature. For example, uh, it's very easy uh, to store, but uh, it can also be uh, somehow programmable. Uh, by this meaning that uh, uh, on top of the value of the of, of the instrument of the coin, uh, the uh, the a, a CBDC could also bring uh, information on the specific transaction. Um, it is uh, uh, publicly uh, supplied, so it's completely different from uh, liability of the private sector. For example, commercial bank money or electronic money, uh, which are emitted by uh, you know private entities. And uh, it's uh, uh, completely different from uh, uh, a, crypto, uh, a crypto asset, which is essentially no backing, while uh, central bank digital currency are backed uh, by the private sector. It is somehow, in some aspects, uh, similar to a stable coin, to which we will not talk today, uh, but difference in many characteristics, one of which is that uh, uh, different from uh, uh, stable coins, the CBDC is backed by the full might of the uh, central bank who issue it, uh, which guarantees it, the stability of its value. Uh, the idea of this paper uh, comes uh, uh, from the ongoing debate on what would happen when and if central bank issue a CBDC. And essentially, if you think about it, there's not a completely new concept. Uh, already Tobin in 1980s uh, had the idea of the general public having an account at the central bank. And this, uh, these accounts uh, are not completely new in history. Uh, they were possible in the US uh, before World War II, and also in France, to some extent, uh, um, agents were able to hold, uh, in some form, money at the central bank before the Second World War. Uh, the literature on CBDC is growing, very much uh, technical in nature, so how it should be designed, what is the difference between a uh, token-based and account-based, um, and tackles uh, uh, some very important macro-financial stability questions, but the literature is still uh, uh, limited uh, in its reach uh, on uh, open economy implications. And uh, this is very relevant for policy, uh, 
because many countries are, are planning or are thinking or are discussing the issuance of a CBDC. And some very large countries are very much ahead of the curve, uh, such as China, uh, where we probably know there are already large uh, scale tests of a CBDC, and they plan to uh, bring it up for the next uh, uh, Olympic game they will, they will host. Now, uh, what are the, uh, what, what is the menu of my presentation? Essentially, I will uh, present you a, an open economy uh, model with two countries. Uh, where the CBDC is included within the monetary assets that uh, agents can hold. And particularly, um, we will try to understand a bit what are the uh, open macro implications of alternative uh, technical design. And we will we'll do so uh, along two dimensions. One is uh, looking at transmission of shocks driven throughout the CBDC. Another one is to look at welfare and uh, what are the prescriptions for optimal policy when the CBDC is included. Uh, the uh, preview of the result is the following. Uh, a CBDC uh, amplifies spillover of shocks and uh, uh, the technical design feature matter a lot. In particular, uh, uh, a flexible remuneration of CBDC can reduce spillover. Uh, the, the CBDC would also increase asymmetries in the international monetary system and uh, uh, it could reduce the monetary policy autonomy of the country that do not emit the CBDC. Uh, and this is due, uh, as I will show later, to the fact that with the CBDC, uh, for a, the spillover of shocks uh, is much stronger. Now, just to give you a bird eye view of the model, it's uh, uh, a standard two country model with usual frictions uh, and uh, a rich menu of monetary assets. Um, it has two blocks, a domestic and a foreign economy. In the domestic economy, which is very much similar to the foreign economy, uh, households uh, uh, can uh, uh, invest into cash, which is the simplest way to carry uh, liquidity from one period to another, uh, bonds and uh, uh, bank deposits, and they consume and supply labor. Uh, when the CBDC is introduced, uh, a new uh, item will pop up in the menu of monetary assets of agents, which is essentially the CBDC. And we allow only one country, the domestic economy, to issue the CBDC. Now, the important thing about this, this chart is the box in the middle, um, which uh, highlights uh, uh, what determines the exchange rate. Is. Absent the CBDC, uh, uh, the exchange rate is determined by essentially trading goods and trade uh, in, in assets, which are cross-country bonds. When the CBDC is introduced, um, of course, uh, the CBDC uh, will, be, uh, will generate uh, a new cross-country asset holding condition uh, between uh, uh, CBDC and, and bonds, and, and this cross-country asset holding condition would uh, determine the, will contribute to determine the exchange rate and in turn uh, affect the other variables uh, in the model. Uh, before going on, it's probably uh, worth to uh, zoom a little bit into the characteristic of the different uh, uh, assets that agents can hold. As I said, uh, one is cash. Uh, in the model, uh, cash uh, is, is, is very widely uh, defined. So think about it as M2. Uh, everything that can be used uh, as a liquid instrument in transaction. And the characteristic we model of cash is that it is uh, essentially super liquid. It is safe, but it does not bear interest rate and it cannot be used internationally. It has also some uh, uh, limited scalability capacity uh, to, to give the idea that it's difficult to uh, pile up a large amount uh, of this instrument. Then there are bonds, uh, which are uh, scalable and pay interest rate. They are also safe, and they can be used internationally. Uh, the problem is that they are not good for transaction. They cannot be uh, used for pay. Finally, we have deposits that in this case are really uh, need really to be understood as term deposits. Uh, so something that is not used for payment, but it pays an interest rate and uh, is uh, easily, uh, easily scalable. In this model, we restrict and do not allow for cross country uh, deposits. Uh, arguably, uh, this will not drastically change uh, the key mechanism of transaction uh, of transmission that I will show uh, later on in the, model, in the presentation. And finally, there is a CBDC, uh, which combines to various degrees all the characteristics of the previous assets. And in particular, we have parameters that can vary uh, the degree of, uh, of which the CB, in which the CBDC is uh, valuable for each of these assets. 
Uh, so there will be a parameter that determines liquidity, there will be a, a parameter that determines uh, uh, remuneration, and uh, there will be a, a parameter that will determine the ease of use in international transactions. Now, one key thing that I will not repeat for the rest of the presentation, when, when I don't say differently, uh, we assume that the CBT has no remuneration, so that the interest rate is fixed. Now, how we model it? Uh, we model in the simplest way possible, so we assume that uh, household need uh, uh, liquidity for payments, and this liquidity for payments generate uh, utility. Why? Because it relaxes the utility constraint of household. You can analytically prove that uh, doing this, so inserting uh, uh, liquidity in the utility function, is uh, uh, essentially identical to a cash in advance constraint but it's way easier uh, uh, in terms of tractability, in particular because it allows us to express uh, the parameter of the CBDC as a, a function of the parameter of cash through this theta parameter, this theta variable. And this theta variable essentially captures how much the CBDC uh, is uh, uh, valuable uh, in, in payments. When theta is zero, uh, you see that the red part of this equation goes away. Hence, the, param the CBDC has no value in payments. It's just uh, a monetary instrument and investment. When theta is one, uh, the parameters that determine the uh, utility, so the amount at which the CBDC relaxes the utility, the budget constraint of household, um, is uh, these parameters are essentially equal to the parameter of cash. Uh, and, and this means that the CBDC gives uh, or provides the same liquidity services as cash. And then we allow theta to vary uh, in the domain in, in the domain uh, of uh, zero and uh, uh, plus infinite, potentially. And this tells you uh, that the CBDC is uh, uh, less efficient than cash in payments if theta is below one, or more efficient than cash in payment if theta is bigger than one. And later I will show how uh, changing this parameterization somehow uh, has an impact on the quantitative, not the qualitative, but the quantitative prediction. When you take the first order condition, you get this uh, CBDC holding condition uh, that basically equals uh, the value of the CBDC in terms of payment on the left hand side with the cost of acquiring a unit of CBDC on the right hand side. And what is the cost? The cost is the amount of consumption someone give up, gives up today to buy the CBDC uh, net uh, of the amount of consumption one is able to enjoy tomorrow because it has the CBDC, net of the, of the real remuneration. And the real remuneration is, of course, a function of the CBDC uh, uh, remuneration rate, RDC, that again, in the baseline uh, simulation, is set to constant. We allow also the foreign household to buy the CBDC uh, for the same reason. And this is their uh, uh, CBDC holding condition, which differs from the condition of, in the domestic economy for three items. First, uh, you notice that the, C, that the remuneration is adjusted for exchange rate risk. Why? Because, of course, foreign households are rational households, and they know that uh, uh, when buying the CBDC, they are investing in an instrument that is denominated in a foreign currency. So the total uh, uh, remuneration for this investment, of course, needs to take into account uh, exchange rate effect. Second, we allow for capital constraints. So the fact that uh, it might become more costly for foreigners to access the domestic CBDC. Capital constraint, the ease of use of the CBDC in the international market is governed by this parameter P here. And of course, you can imagine on, on a, a parameterization which P is extremely high, which uh, equals to a closed CBDC capital account. Finally, uh, uh, Foreign households also use the CBDC in payments, of course, net of uh, exchange. And this leads us, uh, after you do some math, uh, to the key mechanism of the model, which is a, a CBDC cross-country holding condition. Um, and this CBDC uh, cross-country holding condition implies an equality uh, between the uh, remuneration of, on bonds issued in the foreign car country and the uh, interest rate pay on the CBDC, net of uh, exchange rate adjustment. And let's break it down uh, into its component. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the CBDC remuneration, which is a, a net of exchange rate adjustment. And notice that RDC, this item here, in the baseline simulation is constant, because there is the remuneration. But there is another thing that pop up, and is this item in red, which is the uh, CBDC uh, liquidity services. 
and we call this a liquidity markup because it's strictly larger than one and it acts as a multiplier of the element in the in blue on the right hand side of the equal so each uh, uh, movement in the uh, in the exchange rate is reflected in movement on the policy rate in the foreign countries by a factor bigger than one because there is this liquidity markup and captures the idea that the CBDC has intrinsic value because it gives you uh, payment services. And why is this key? This is key because it's a completely new equation. It is uh, asymmetric because it's also all in the foreign country. It is completely different from the uh, standard arbitrage condition between bond and uh, between domestic and foreign bond. And in different in two dimensions. First, there is the liquidity markup that here is absent, which multiplies the effect of what is going on in this first bracket. Second, very importantly, in a standard cross-country uh, bond holding condition, you have the uh, remuneration on domestic bonds that is also variable. So any shock to uh, expectation to the exchange rate uh, is partially absorbed by the foreign interest rate, partially absorbed by the domestic rate. When the CBDC is introduced with fixed remuneration, uh, the foreign interest rate is the only variable that can absorb the, the shock. And this uh, leads to some uh, you know, ideas on how the model should behave. Uh, that are the following. First, uh, you know, for the same expected appreciation, expected movement on the exchange rate, you should expect a stronger reaction of R star, the interest rate on the foreign economy when the CBDC is in. And you should also somehow expect a, a stronger overshooting today because the domestic interest rates are, uh, which moves generally in a standard cross country bond holding condition, does not move in the CBDC bond holding condition because it's fixed. If you take one and two together, then of course you should expect stronger impact on the real economy, probably uh, through investment and consumption, and, and, and hence uh, spillover should be uh, overall stuff. Uh, there is an easy way in which this can be tested. Uh, it is through impulse response function. Uh, here we uh, contrast uh, the black and the gray line, where the black line is the model with the CBDC, and uh, the gray line is the model without the CBDC. Uh, the first panel that I showed here shows the reaction of domestic variables. As you see, very little is going on except the exchange rate, which overshoots by about 50% more when the CBDC is introduced. And now let's look at foreign variables. Uh, when we look at foreign variables, we uh, notice that the foreign interest rate shoots up by about 30 basis points more in response to the same TSP shock. And this has a, a real implication in the uh, foreign economy. Now, you might wonder how much this uh, uh, would change uh, when we change the remuneration on the CBDC, and we're doing so in this uh, exercise. Uh, this chart is a little bit tricky to, to go through, so let me first uh, guide you through how it reads. It, it should be read. On the horizontal axis, you have theta. So the horizontal axis tells you the degree of liquidity services that the CBDC provides. Points on the right-hand side uh, are associated to parameterization where the CBDC gives more liquidity services. Uh, we start by uh, looking at 0 0.5, which means that the CBDC is half as efficient as cash. And we end up in, with 1.5, uh, meaning that the CBDC is 50% more efficient than cash. Now, the vertical axis in fact, is the accumulated spillover, so the difference between the model without the CBDC and the model with the CBDC. The higher is the, are the values on the vertical axis, the more the introduction of the CBDC for the same shock uh, amplifies below. And then you have the two lines, again, black and, uh, and gray, just so this, this is more confusing, uh, that instead in this, in this case are not the model with or without the CBDC, but are different parameterization of the fee parameter, so the level of capital performance. As a first exercise, uh, and, and this is what is shown here, we, can, we uh, have a CBDC when the uh, supply is fixed. And we let the market determine the price of the CBDC in order to adjust the demand and supply. What you show here, what we show here uh, is that again, spillover to the domestic economy are, are small, um, uh, are ever small, and somehow depend on the uh, degree of capital constraint, but not so much. Uh, naturally, these things, these spillovers, they become larger, so better, more negative, the more the liquidity the CBDC gives. Again, here in the foreign economy, 
our spillovers become also larger, the more liquidity services are given by the CDC. Why? Oh, sorry, sorry. Why? Uh, because the, uh, multi, uh, the, the multiplicative term in the equation I've shown you before becomes larger, of course, uh, the larger it is. And it seems that uh, reasonable changes in the parameterization of the capital constraint, they do not change a lot with the uh, cumulative spill. Now, let's turn to another case in which the uh, remuneration of the CBDC follows a, a Taylor type. Well, in this case, uh, I, I already uh, bring you to the key conclusion is, is the thing circled in red here. Uh, you notice, so you should be able to see that spillovers are, reduct, uh, are reduced by a factor of 10. Why? Uh, because in this, in this, in this uh, parameter, in this type of uh, uh, calibration of the remuneration of the CBDC, we allow it to be time varying and to respond to the business cycle. Essentially, we set a, a, a remuneration rule for the CBDC that mimics a lot of the Taylor rule on the policy. And when you do so, uh, look what happens. Uh, you can plot the uh, uh, the uh, model based simulation simulation of the interest rate in the domestic economy that you have here on the horizontal axis and the remuneration rate on the CBDC that you have here on the vertical axis. All these dots are all point uh, uh, are all points in the simulation of the model. And of course, you know when the remuneration is fixed, uh, uh, all these dots are scattered uh, around the zero the horizontal line because there, there is no variation. You see that something happens when the remuneration is, uh, when the CBDC is issued with a quantity based rule, but not so much. What is really striking is that, of course, when you have the CBDC rate that moves in the same uh, direction of, along with uh, the uh, interest rate in the domestic economy, so the two are scattered around the 35 degree line, um, you have spillovers that are minimized. And this is due to the fact that uh, the two equations I've shown you before, so the uh, cross uh, uh, country CBDC holding condition and the um, bond holding condition, uh, they are really similar. Actually, the only difference between the two equations is the mark, is the liquidity markup of the CBDC. So you have some aspect from the issuing of the CBDC, but the main effect that is through the uh, policy rate and the interest rate and exchange rate channel is uh, sterilized by the fact that the CBDC rate moves along with the policy rate in the country that emits it. So there are not real uh, big consequences for a foreign economy because the bulk of the trade-off uh, between uh, CBDC and, and uh, foreign uh, bonds uh, was actually already there and was there in the cross-country bond holding condition that existed before the issuance of the CBDC. Now let me turn to the last exercise. That is the optimal policy exercise that you can easily implement in, in such a model. Um, essentially, the central bank in each country wants to maximize household welfare, the discounted sum of utility, uh, using uh, uh, the parameters uh, of this uh, policy rule, which are the uh, persistent rate of the uh, interest rate, the uh, reaction to inflation, and, uh, and output. Uh, where, where Y here is, is, uh, is really key, uh, is out of growth between period uh, T and T minus one. Now, uh, this is a nonlinear problem we solve uh, with uh, solving the model second order with the uh, absolutely usual tools, uh, and, and we get to this result. And uh, this is quite striking because, on the one hand, uh, you have the, that the, um, uh, the domestic central bank actually does not face a, a large new trade off. When the CBDC is implemented, you see a little bit stronger reaction to inflation, a little bit stronger reaction to output, but not nothing that is quantitatively uh, significant. Really, uh, the real change is in the foreign economy. When the foreign uh, uh, economy, when the foreign central bank needs to think uh, at its uh, uh, optimal monetary policy strategy, when the CBDC uh, is implemented, uh, all of a sudden it has to react much stronger to uh, inflation and much stronger to output in order to stabilize the uh, domestic business cycle. And why is it so? Well, uh, this is actually embedded in the, um, in the uh, input responses I've shown you before. Uh, there you would see that when the CBDC uh, is introduced, uh, the spillover of shocks is much, is much higher, and hence the uh, central banks need to act more aggressively uh, to stabilize this 
notably, um, this uh, uh, this bar here uh, are, of course, are as I said at the beginning, are uh, the results of the model when the uh, interest rate on the CBDC is fixed. Of course, you can play the same game when you have a flexible remuneration on the CBDC interest rate, and in that case, you will see that the um, that the uh, foreign central bank is much better off in the sense that it has to adapt its uh, monetary policy strategy way less. However, uh, if you com com uh, compute welfare outcome, you also realize that this configuration, uh, so with a flexible remuneration, is the configuration that delivers the uh, lowest welfare for the domestic economy. So in a sense, it's not incent incentive compatible, or at least uh, would give raise to a question of uh, coordination uh, across country, because essentially they need to decide on how to split the benefit in the foreign economy for receiving lower spillovers, in order to compensate the domestic economy that has to uh, uh, choose a CBDC uh, remuneration, uh, a CBDC remuneration scheme that is not really uh, optimal. And this gives About me- five me, minutes. I'm, I, I, I'm to the conclusion. Uh, I try to, to be brief so that the discussion could have a bit more time. Uh, so the, um, uh, the conclusion are the following. As, as I said, uh, the CBDC amplifies international spillover and what a crucial emerger is that the design feature matter a lot. In particular, capital controls, they do matter, and the remuneration on the CBDC rate also matters uh, uh, strictly. Uh, on the contrary, uh, quantitative restrictions to the amount of CBDC in circulation, they seem to be less uh, effective as a, a, a sterilization mechanism for spillover. Uh, when the CBDC is in, uh, then you have the asymmetries in international monetary system that, is, that are larger, and, uh, and you also have some effects on the degree of uh, monetary policy autonomy for the foreign economy. And again, these effects, they crucially depend on design options, uh, such as liquidity or uh, remuneration. Um, and this leads me to the end of my talk, and I gladly leave the floor to the discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's over to Amu as a discussion, uh, as a discussion. And it's great we have uh, an extra few minutes. Thank Go you, Mike. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers of Zebra for asking me to discuss this uh, nice paper on central bank digital currency in an open economy by Massimo Anoth and Livio. Um, this paper is very important. The findings are very interesting and intriguing, and it's currently very relevant uh, in the context of, you know, uh, the central bank's interest in issuing CBDC. So the paper is clearly motivated by the recent discussions surrounding CBDC issuance. Um, so as we all know, the BIS survey, which I am also going to talk about in my presentation, has kind of uh, caught up on, like, uh, the central banks are very keen on implementing CBDC in the next few years. And the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of renewed the interest on CBDCs because there, there are some concerns as to whether the virus could be transmitted by cash. And the paper is also uh, motivated very much by the very sparse literature on open economy implications of CBDC. So their paper is a valuable contribution in this front. So the paper uses a two country DSG model with CBDC and uh, the model is asymmetric in the sense that uh, the central bank of only one country issues CBDC. However, CBDC circulates in both countries. So foreign ownership of CBDC is allowed. And CBDC also coexists with a lot of other monetary and financial assets. So the CBDC and cash are the liquid assets and also other um, interest bearing assets on uh, deposits, domestic and foreign bonds do exist in their model. Um, so with regard to their results, um, so they're uh, based on their model, they are um, able to develop an interesting arbitrage condition between the foreign risk-free rate and CBDC rate. And uh, uh, this, uh, as Massimo just explained right now, um, previously in the presentation, uh, this uh, wedge between the foreign risk rate, rate and CBDC rate is primarily driven by the liquidity markup. And in the context of CBDC being circulated, the exchange rate dynamics is even more um, uh, for the foreign economy. And they find that the presence of internationally traded CBDC increases the spillover effects uh, from domestic shocks to the foreign economy. 
and they consider both the context of domestic productivity shock and uh, domestic monetary policy shock. And they also make comparisons on the spillover effects between three types of CBDC designs, uh, one with respect to a fixed CBDC interest rate, next where the CBDC uh, quantity follows a rule, like it's proportional to the amount of output, and the price of the CBDC is allowed to adjust in the market. And finally, they also consider a context where CBDC with flexible interest rate in the sense that the interest rate uh, follows a Taylor rule. And they find that the foreign output spillover effects with the liquidity benefits of CBDC is smaller when the CBDC uh, interest rate follows a flexible Taylor rule. And they also estimated the UIP equation based on simulated data and find CBDC interest rate on, uh, when it's flexible to drive exchange rate movements. And finally, they have a welfare analysis where they uh, talk more about the optimal monetary policy uh, in the context of uh, with and without CBDC. So they find that in the context of with CBDC, the foreign country's monetary policy stance would be more aggressive. And this is not the case when the CBDC interest rate is uh, flexible uh, in the sense that it follows a Taylor rule. So, um, my comments um, um, uh, so starts with the existence of cash and CBDC alone as liquid assets. So in the model, it's mentioned that um, there are storage costs associated with uh, holding cash. So that itself is a motivation to have uh, deposits to be you know, used as a mode of payment. So I think it would be better to have retail deposits in addition to wholesale deposits in the model. And that would kind of make uh, the dynamics between deposits, CBDC and cash uh, even more interesting. Um, and also another um, comment is with respect to the um, symmetry, um, asymmetric uh, uh, model that only um, home country central bank issue CBDC. So does this mean that the foreign economy agents hold deposits, uh, domestic bonds, uh, foreign bonds and uh, CBDC? So then what is how does the wedge between the deposit rate and uh, the, you know, the CBDC rate, how does that play out? So what are the dynamics that drive it? Or is it the case that the deposit rate just mimics the uh, risk-free rate? So some more detail on the dynamics between the deposit rate and CBDC rate would be interesting. Um, another question is with regard to the government budget constraint. So uh, the issuance of CBDC, is it, is it financed by only government spending? So what about the context of Senerage? So is there any rule that uh, limits the amount of Senerage? So Badia and Kumhoff's paper, they have a budgetary deficit rule associated with CBDC. So that kind of limits the Senerage revenue being created. So is there some, something that constrains this? Then my next comment is with respect to the motivation for quantity rule. Uh, so you uh, assume that uh, the quantity of CBDC is proportional to the output. So is there some motivation for using that kind of a rule? Um, then finally, with respect to welfare. Um, so um, the um, I see that you have constructed consumption equivalence between uh, regimes with and without CBDC. So, but then the steady state of consumption would be different between both these regimes. So can a consumption equivalent welfare be constructed? That is another question. Um, it would be also interesting to have more details on the grid search and the interpretation of the va welfare values in the table. So does it mean that the agents get a welfare gain uh, when moving from regime with CBD, uh, without CBDC to with CBDC? And how does it differ between the home economy and foreign economy? And um, finally, um, so um, the optimal coefficients are uh, computed based on the assumption that the other economy is at baseline. So um, that is the reason why the foreign economy a monetary policy stance is more aggressive. So does it have some spillover effects back to the home country? So that is another comment that I have. Yeah. Thank you. Over to uh you, Mike. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, some very, very good questions that I also had. Um, and uh, so maybe it's best because there were a lot of questions if we uh, let Massimo answer first before we go to the floor. Very good, excellent. Um, so let me, let me start off with the uh, easiest, uh, which is the, the, the welfare analysis. Uh, now, as you, as you see uh, in the, uh, and, and, and Apologize if, if, I, if I get a bit technical, but I think the, the best way is to, to, to really look at the uh, 
at the hidden skeleton, no, um, and and to bring it out there. Um, first of all, as you notice, we have uh, modeled the CBDC as uh, uh, money in the utility function, right? Once you do that, uh, you don't change the steady state of consumption in the model. Uh, so this is a general, this is a general, uh, this is a general point. So you, that allows you uh, to uh, uh, to compare directly uh, the two numbers because they're essentially essentially the same. Uh, I'm talking here about the deterministic steady state of the model. And the uh, welfare is not based on a grid search. Uh, if it's stated that in the paper, it's my mistake. Uh, but is actually um, a Newton algorithm uh, that give us uh, that allow us to search uh, the parameter space for the uh, for the optimal welfare. Now, uh, as long as as you are able to do it, you are not always able to do it in this model because maybe they become too complicated. Um, I personally find that that is uh, uh, preferable of of a grid search because it allows you to. Um, Avoid uh, issues that are common with with, with research algorithms that are related to uh, the, um, uh, the the step increase in the grid. No, uh, you, you you can never be really completely sure that you that you get uh, is actually, especially if the problem is very much nonlinear, as in this case, this is a highly nonlinear problem. Uh, it is it is always you know you always have a, a little bit of doubt that the number you get is actually a local uh, optimum. Uh, that is uh, driven by the fact that the uh, that the uh, that the step increase uh, is actually not going uh, because of the step uh, is not going into the region of parameters where the real optimum is. Now uh, this is a problem also with with uh, with Newton Bayes algorithm, but there is a but I uh, there uh, I relied on 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 the on the wide degree of of science that is behind the uh, definition of this algorithm and actually. There, uh, you have the advantage, or at least that's what I do, is that I try uh, several uh, optimization algorithms. I try, I try several starting conditions, and generally, when they give you the, the same outcome, uh, I'm happy, and, and, and I think that that's really the optimum. Um, uh, final question on the on the policy. Uh, that's completely right. That's actually our uh, our research agenda. So what we have been doing uh, in the last month uh, is to try is to try very really hard. Um, and, and this idea is another paper uh, to find out uh, um, an algorithm to solve uh, efficiently uh, this type of uh, of games uh, of policy games uh, in macro models. Uh, you, you might you might be aware of the recent article on Journal of Monetary Economics on this, which is essentially based on uh, an optimization uh, that gives you the path of the interest rate. But we are not interested in that. We are interested in the parameters on the Taylor rule in some sense. So we have to kind of come up with our own algorithm for the solution, um, and we will deploy it in the next iteration of the paper, precisely to tackle this point, which is uh, very much, very much, absolutely spot on. Um, uh, last but not least, uh, CBDC budget constraint. So in our setup, the CBDC is extremely simple. So we we, we put ourselves in the in the shoes of the central bank, and the central bank is simply uh, swapping uh, one type of liquidity for another. Uh, so people, uh, we should we should actually, yeah. This is a thing that 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 we have always be a bit uh, hesitant to put in the model in the paper, mainly for reasons of space. It's already gigantic. We didn't want to make it bigger, but probably should be uh, because you are you are very uh, you know uh, spot on 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 asking this question. Uh, you should have a, you should have a budget constraint, an explicit budget constraint. Now is implicit in the model. Uh, where you will see that uh, uh, really the, the, the central bank keeps the total amount of, uh, of liquidity in circulation constant. When you give, when you want one unit of CBDC, you have to give to the central bank something else, and that's the truth. So that uh, so that uh, you know the, the CBDC is a is a zero sum game in the sense that there is no uh, there is no money creation uh, involved, and, and that's essentially what's going on. And I, I hope I've answered all the questions. Uh, if there are more, uh, happy to take. Uh, and, and thank you for the discussion, of course. Very, very useful. May, may I uh, ask a question? That, uh, the, you are essentially saying that the budget constraint is implicit. It's not part of the model. Does that mean it's a partial equilibrium setup? No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's total equilibrium, but it's just total equilibrium. It's general equilibrium, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just it's not, what I was saying is not reported. It's only not reported, okay. Uh, yeah. That that that's what I that's what I'm saying. 
Um, and as I said, we should we should have it. Uh, we, we we really we never put it because we didn't want to to, to be extraordinary long, but probably it's better to have it just to be completely you know, fully transparent. So what you're saying is that when the central bank issues CBDC, it gets another liquid asset back. Exactly. But 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 the central bank doesn't issue other liquid assets in the model unless you're saying it's literally just cash, in which case what you're saying is that 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 it's M2 is really not correct because M2 is issued mostly by banks. That is uh, that is true. So uh, that, that's why I should have I should have in the in the presentation in the presentation uh, 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 how it, how this works. So essentially, what what the, what what people do. So if 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 I if I were an agent in the model and and I and I wanted a, a unit of CBDC, what I have to do is that I need to liquidate some of my liquid assets, get the money, go to the central bank and swap this money with the CBDC. get one euro cash and go to the central bank and swap this euro cash for one euro CBDC. And, and in this way, you have the, uh, you have that the balance sheet of the, the, the asset side uh, of the central bank remains the same because it received back one euro cash and it emits back one euro CBDC. Uh, but again, uh, your question made me realize that this should be explicit and, and, and it, will be, it will become explicit. And it's quite restrictive, right? Because in that way, you cannot model a central bank that by issuing CBDC actually increases the aggregate amount of liquidity in the economy. In this economy, it does not. In this economy, it does not. It was, again, uh, this was a, let's say it's, 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 it's a choice. No? So we, 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 set, we set up, we set ourselves in this world when the, uh, when the creation of CBDC does not involve the money creation. Uh, right. And, and to connect back because there is no money creation, steady state uh, stay there. No, because you're not in a in a in a you're not in a model with with, with higher uh, uh, with, with higher M. Okay, um, um, I have more questions, but I don't want to preempt the audience. So uh, don't don't raise your hand or anything fancy. Just uh, start speaking if you have another question. Is there anybody? Unmute yourself. Apparently not, in which case I will ask my last question, if that's okay. It's super good. Um, one thing that wasn't clear from the presentation is the issuer issues CBDC, but also pursues monetary policy as per usual, it, it, which means that uh, basically, he or she would have to have two policy rules, one for the interest rate on reserves and one for the interest rate on CBDC. And if that is the case, there is also a second uh, cross-border arbitrage condition, namely between the two, two pure bonds in the two countries rather than only the one that you have shown. Is that somewhere present in the model or am I missing something? Is there? Is there? So what? What is not clear is that the the, the condition I've talked so much about uh, is there on top of the uh, of the cross on the usual cross country bond holding condition that stays there and will stay there for the rest of our life. So presumably, no, it's not going to change. Uh, it, it's just a, a. I see it as an additional constraint. No, to the to the yes. dynamics. Uh, it's it's on top. Uh, uh, and and as you noticed, you know, there was the almost equal sign, because to make things uh, um, easier for me, uh, I abstracted from uh, uh, imperfect risk sharing uh, in the presentation. But of course, in the model, uh, you have uh, you have cost associated to holding cross border assets. Uh, so risk sharing is not perfect in both cases, both with CBC and bond. OK, so unless somebody in the meantime came up with a question, we can two minutes ahead of time, move on to the next paper, uh, which is Amu, uh, Amu George. Yes, so, um, thank you, Michael. Let me share my screen again. So um, today I'll be presenting my paper on central bank digital currency with adjustable interest rate in small open economies. 
This paper is co-authored with my colleague, Tao Junzi from National University of Singapore and my doctoral supervisor, Joseph Alba from Nanyang Technological University. So the motivation of our paper, as Massimo discussed earlier in his presentation as well, uh, is um, primarily with respect to the central bank's interest concerning CBDC issuance. So the reason COVID-19 pandemic has not only really resulted in the increasing adoption of more um, digitized modes of payments, but it has also caused central more kind of a renewed discussions on CBDC issuance. And according to the recent BIS survey um, around um, uh, central banks who are representing around fifth of the world's population are likely to implement CBDC in the next three years. And the focus of the central banks, according to the um, survey results, are primarily on retail CBDCs. So by definition, um, retail CBDC is very analogous to cash in the sense that the end users are households or businesses. So they are very liquid. And the focus of the central banks um, in this survey uh, has been largely on domestic CBDC. So CBDC, which circulates only within the domestic economy. But they are also thoroughly reviewing the implications surrounding uh, you know, cross-border usage of C uh, CBDC as well. So um, apart from the uh, discussion on you know, uh, the inherent uh, issuance of CBDC in the near future, another interesting point of discussion uh, surrounds the interest-bearing feature of CBDCs. So um, interest-bearing money by itself is not a new phenomena, but then in the context of cash, it's very costly. But for CBDCs um, with a lower data storage cost or with a robust um, you know, um, uh, ledger technology, it is easily implementable uh, by the central bank to have uh, interest-bearing CBDC. Additionally, another advantage of having interest-bearing CBDs is that it could, be, it could act as a secondary monetary policy instrument of the central bank to achieve the price stability mandate. So in this context, our research question is to analyze the welfare implications of a central bank in a small open economy, um, introducing a domestic retail CBDC. And this domestic retail CBDC earns the adjustable interest rate and which is also used as a secondary monetary policy instrument by the central bank. So our approach to the question is by using an open economy DSG framework where both uh, CBDC and deposits are competing medium of exchange. And uh, CBDC is also a competing asset of uh, both domestic bonds and foreign bonds. So with respect to the preview of main findings, so we generate uh, parity conditions between CBDC and other competing assets in our model. Uh, we find that adjustable CBDC interest rate generally gives better social outcomes than fixed CBDC interest rate. Uh, however, there are distribution consequences and the welfare outcomes are highly conditional on the source of uncertainty which is considered for the simulation. Uh, we also find that CBDC as a monetary policy instrument creates a lot of liquidity changes in the domestic economy, and this has implications on the agents' choices concerning their consumption demand and labor supply. And we also uh, find that CBDC as a monetary policy instrument does indeed help uh, central banks to achieve more stability in prices and exchange rate. Additionally, we have a novel finding that uh, in the context of domestic CBDC, the central bank can use the CBDC as a means to influence the domestic economy while influencing by sorry by, by uh, while simultaneously managing exchange rates through the uncovered interest parity condition. So um, the literature on CBDC is uh, it has exponentially grown over the past few years. And uh, our paper is very closely related to the seminal paper by Badir and Kumhoff on the macroeconomics of central bank digital currencies. Uh, our paper is also related to the literature on exchange rate management. Um, um, the literature on open economy CBDC implications is very sparse. And one of the important papers is by Ferrari, uh, Mehel and Strakov, which uh, Massimo just presented previously. Um, now to start, um, I'll give a model uh, overview. So the domestic setup of our model uh, is a simplified variant of uh, an earlier version of the uh, Badir and Kumhoff paper in 2016. So uh, their model is more rich, they consider other sectors, but uh, we, our um, model co concentrates only on the consumption sector because we are interested only in retail CBDC. Um, the interactions of the domestic economy with the world arises through three channels. 
First, the uh, some section of the agents they purchase, uh, in, uh, they trade international bonds with the world. Second, the firms they use imported intermediate inputs in their production process, and finally, the firms they export finished goods abroad. Also, the central bank in our model, their, their mandate is to have price stability. So they use two instruments to achieve price stability. First, the, uh, the conventional uh, instrument of uh, the policy interest rate, or in other words, the interest rate on bonds. Um, if the CBDC interest rate is adjustable, the, then the central bank can use an additional secondary monetary policy instrument. So um, it, this could either be the CBDC interest rate or CBDC supply. So um, the households in our model, they comprise of agents who are either financially constrained or unconstrained. Uh, both these agents, their um, objective is to maximize their lifetime utility and their lifetime utility uh, depends on their consumption bundle, which follows a habit formation. Um, the utility function also depends on their labor supply as well as liquidity services that is available to them. So um, um, un unconstrained agents who are part of the household, uh, so they are the marginal investors in the sense that they are primarily interested in investing and getting returns from the assets. So um, their liquidity service comprises only of deposits. They do not hold CBDC because they, don't, they are not interested in uh, payment modes, rather in earning interest on the assets. So the assets held by the unconstrained agents are domestic bonds, foreign bonds, and deposits. Um, so the budget constraint of the unconstrained agents is given here. So they hold both uh, domestic bonds and deposits, and they receive returns on all these assets. Um, they provide labor services for which they receive income after income tax. Um, they also receive a, a, a portion of lump sum income and the um, interest rate on foreign bonds um, is converted into a domestic currency using real exchange rate and they consume as well. Next, we have the constrained agents. So constrained agents uh, uh, comprise the majority of the household. Um, and uh, constrained agents are financially constrained. So they require loans to finance their consumption needs. Um, so the banking sector follows exactly the Bardi and Kumhoff uh, framework where uh, loans are a means of credit creation. So um, the constrained agents to pay for their consumption needs, they use both deposits and CBDC. So deposits and CBDC are, act as both a medium of exchange as well as a asset for constrained agents. So um, constrained agents, they uh, receive loans. Um, they also hold uh, deposits in CBDC uh, with, for which they earn interest rate. They again provide labor services to the firm for which they receive income after income tax. They are also the owners of the firm uh, from which they receive the profit. And uh, they also receive a share of the lump sum income. Um, the uh, interesting part is with respect to their consumption spending here. So when they pay for their consumption, they have to incur the, uh, uh, the uh, consumption tax as well as they incur some monetary transaction cost while spending. And this monetary transaction cost is dependent on the amount of consumption as well as the liquidity service that is available to the constrained agents. So here the liquidity service does not enter their utility function. It enters via the monetary transaction cost. So uh, the liquidity services that are available to constrained agents comprise both of deposits and CBDC. Um, and CBDC due to transactional efficiency provides uh, more liquidity than deposits. So that is indicated by this cyan coefficient, which is greater than one. So which means that when they use more of CBDC, this lowers the markup associated with the monetary transaction cost while spending. Um, so uh, that kind of makes the consumption spending more efficient. Also, this um, uh, markup tax, which is liquidity tax, which is given over here, it has implications on the marginal rate of substitution of the constrained agents between the, their uh, labor hours and uh, consumption. So based on the first order conditions from both the constrained and unconstrained agents, we develop parity conditions between uh, CBDC and other assets. 
So here we have the parity condition between CBDC and deposits. So from here, we can see that the interest rate differential between uh, deposit rate and CBDC rate is driven entirely by the marginal cost, marginal transaction cost associated with deposits and CBDC. So if the marginal transaction costs are same, then the deposit rate would exactly mimic, sorry, the CBDC rate would exactly mimic the deposit rate. So if the central bank wants to use CBDC interest rate as an in instrument and they should have autonomy over it, then this transaction, marginal transaction cost with re, uh, respect to CBDC has to be different from that of deposits. Now, how do we make it different? Um, that arises through the psi m coefficient and the elasticity. So both deposits and CBDC has to be imperfect substitutes for um, um, CBDC interest rate to behave different, differently than a deposit rate. Next, the, uh, we have the interest parity condition between CBDC and foreign bonds. So the interest rate differential is not only really driven by the exchange rate uh, dynamics, but it's also driven by how well deposits and CBDC act as a medium of exchange. And also with respect to the marginal utility to the unconstrained agent with respect to liquidity and consumption. So it's not exactly an uncovered interest interest parity condition between uh, CBDC and foreign bonds, there are ad additional factors in play as well. Next, we have the firms. So here firms, it uses both imported uh, intermediate inputs, which we can consider as capital inputs and uh, labor services. So since these capital in inputs are imported, they have to pay the cost of paying one unit of capital is the real exchange rate, and they have to pay the wages for the labor services as well. Uh, so this constitutes the profit maximization problem of the firm. Uh, we assume Calvo style uh, price stickiness in the sense that only a fraction of the firms are able to reset their prices in a given period. Um, since uh, the real exchange rate um, uh, is, uh, is the amount of pay payment for the in uh, imported intermediate inputs, the marginal cost is driven by both wages and the real exchange rate. So this is an important channel through which the real exchange rate dynamics would have an impact on the domestic price inflation in the economy. Then finally, firms export uh, finished goods abroad. Uh, you know, uh, after um, the finished goods uh, can be used for both domestic consumption as well as for exporting abroad. Next, with respect to the uh, monetary policy, so traditionally, um, the quantity of money in the economy has been controlled through the bond interest rate. So in the current framework of cash, where uh, you know the interest rate on cash is zero, uh, the quantity of money is influenced by the bond interest rate that is set by the central bank, So which is nothing but the opportunity cost of holding money. But when CBDC interest rate is adjustable, um, uh, the central bank has an option uh, to go for adjustable CBDC interest rate, and it can set the interest rate on CBDC in addition to the interest rate on bonds. So both these can act as complementary monetary policy instruments to achieve price stability in the economy. So in order to make a comparison between the regimes, uh, so first we have the primary interest, uh, primary monetary policy instrument of the central bank, which is nothing but the conventional Taylor rule. So here the policy rate, or in other words, the interest rate on bonds uh, responds to the uh, annualized forward looking inflation. Um, and it's driven by the inflation feedback coefficient over here. Next, um, to make comparisons between uh, the CBDC regimes, we have three regimes here. First is the baseline regime. Uh, so here the CBDC interest rate is fixed at the steady state. So this is very uh, similar to the current framework of cash because the cash gives a fixed interest rate of zero. So if this IM bar is zero, this, this regime is somewhat similar to the current context of cash. Um, and if the CBDC interest rate is adjustable, the central bank can either switch between price rule or quantity rule. So in price rule, the um, uh, CBDC interest rate is set according to this rule where uh, any changes in the uh, forward looking annualized inflation would have impact on the spread between CBDC uh, and bond interest rate. So if the spread declines, which means um, CBDC would be unattractive to the agents and they would endogenously um, uh, reduce their holdings of CBDC. Or the central bank can go for the quantity rule framework where the CBDC supply is set by this rule. So here, if there is uh, inflation in the economy, the central bank would remove the quantity of CBDC from circulation and the interest rate on CBDC would uh, adjust accordingly in the market. 
Um, parameterization, a few uh, of the parameters in our model are taken from literature, large, largely again from Bardier and Kumhoff, uh, but um, a majority of the uh, parameters in our model are calibrated uh, to uh, match these steady state targets, either based on New Zealand data, uh, which we consider as a prototype of small open economy. Uh, in the instances where the data is not available, uh, we use the steady state targets as given in the Bardier and Kumhoff paper of 2016. So there's a typo here. Um, next, we have the baseline estimation. Um, so uh, the um, parameters concerning the shocks, the autocorrelation coefficients, the standard deviation uh, are all estimated using Bayesian uh, estimation. And we use New Zealand data to do the estimation process. Uh, apart from the shock coefficients, we also estimate the baseline regime Taylor rule coefficients as well. Um, uh, using the uh, data and the priors are uh, set using uh, literature and the shocks that we consider are domestic productivity shock, preferences shock, which is nothing but the shock to marginal utility of consumption, uh, money demand shock, foreign interest rate shock and export demand shock. So uh, after estimating the uh, baseline model, so both with respect to the uh, Taylor rule coefficient and the shock coefficients, uh, in order to check the performance of the model, we compared the, um, uh, the second order moments of the model with respect to a standard deviation and autocorrelation of key economic variables with their data uh, counterparts. And we found that they are largely matching. Uh, so the performance is okay for the baseline model. Um, next, we wanted to also see as to uh, after estimation, what um, shocks are driving the volatility of the uh, key variables more. So we found that productivity and marginal utility of the consumption shocks are what is driving the most of the volatility of the key economic variables. Um, so uh, we um, the uh, cal, um, uh, as I discussed previously, we estimated the uh, baseline regime. Uh, policy coefficients, but the question still remains as to what are the policy coefficient values associated with price rule and quantity rule regimes, that is when CBDC interest rate is adjustable. So here we uh, assume that the central bank is a social planner and the objective of the central bank is to maximize the uh, social welfare uh, of the economy and the social welfare is nothing but the uh, weighted average of the lifetime utility of both the agents in the economy. Um, so we conduct grid searches here to find the value of the uh, optimal coefficients that would maximize the uh, social welfare. And we find these are the optimal coefficients. So here, um, the inflation feedback coefficient of price rule is 8.1. So this would mean that an increase in the uh, annualized forward-looking inflation by 1% would <clears throat> reduce the uh, spread between CBDC and bond interest rate by around 2% because this coefficient is divided by four. Uh, for quantity rule, uh, this coefficient is 19.4, which means that uh, an increase in the infl annualized inflation by 1% would result in the removal of uh, uh, annualized CBDC uh, ratio from the economy by around 4%. Uh, then we, um, so after computing the um, optimal coefficients, we also wanted to see as to whether does the agents, um, um, you know, um, uh, have a welfare gain when the central bank uh, switches from a fixed CBDC interest, interest rate system that is analogous to cash to a framework where CBDC interest rate is adjustable? So uh, we use the consumption equivalent measure, which uh, shows the percentage of uh, consumption goods which an agent is willing to forego to move from a baseline regime to the uh, price rule or quantity rule regime. So since these values are positive, it means that they're willing to forego uh, you know, uh, goods to move from baseline to a uh, price rule or quantity rule regime. So there is a welfare gain. And this welfare gain is primarily driven by the welfare gain of constrained agents who have access to CBDC. Uh, however, unconstrained agents, they suffer huge welfare losses. This is quite intuitive because they are the marginal investors. So any uh, changes that the central bank makes in terms of interest rate or liquidity would create a lot of uncertainty for them in terms of investments. So uh, it is intuitive that they would suffer a welfare loss when the CBDC interest rate is adjustable and set by the central bank. Next, we um, look uh, at the welfare plot as to um, we compute the, um, the welfare gain um, associated with different values of the inflation feedback coefficient for both price rule and quantity rule regime. Interestingly, we find that even when 
the C, uh, adjustable CBDC interest rate is not used as a monetary policy tool, still the agents, they, uh, they kind of experience welfare gain. And this welfare gain increases until it reaches the optimal level and kind of decreases thereafter. And the welfare gain associated with the price rule regime is uh, higher than the welfare gain associated with the quantity rule regime at all levels of the inflation feedback coefficient. Um, next, we wanted to see as to, uh, okay, uh, there are uh, five shocks being in consideration. Does all shocks kind of result in a welfare improvement? But uh, the answer is no. Only, uh, it's only under two shocks that the agents uh, uh, kind of have a welfare gain. Uh, and it's driven by productivity and marginal utility shock. And this is uh, for when we go back to the variance decomposition, most of the volatility in the variables is explained by productivity and marginal utility of consumption shock. So these two shocks driving the welfare gain is kind of uh, self-explanatory. So next we look at, uh, you know, the uh, dynamics associated with the productivity shock. So output expands, consumption expands uh, due to increase in aggregate supply. There is deflation in the economy. So inflation goes down. Uh, nominal policy rate reacts to this inflation. So this is a primary monetary policy instrument. Uh, in the context where CBDC interest rate is adjustable, then the uh, secondary monetary policy instrument kicks in and we find that the spread between the policy and CBDC rate drops significantly and the uh, CBDC ratio also rises uh, when CBDC interest rate is uh, adjustable. Um, the increase in the amount of CBDC um, lowers the liquidity tax, which I mentioned earlier. So while um, engaging in consumption, uh, cons uh, constrained agents, they suffer some monetary transaction costs. So this uh, monetary transaction cost would be kind of lower because the liquidity tax has gone down, uh, due to which um, the agents would have a higher consumption under price rule and quantity rule regime. But this uh, drop in liquidity tax also impacts the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and labor. So that impacts their choices regarding labor hours as well. So labor hours are found to drop less uh, when CBDC interest rate is adjustable. Next, we look at the uh, volatility of the key variables when under all the shocks. So here we see that liquidity has a lot more volatility when CBDC interest rate is adjustable and consumption uh, kind of follows through because consumption is again highly dependent on the amount of liquidity in the economy and so consumption is also vo more volatile when CBDC and um, uh, interest rate is adjustable. However, as I mentioned earlier, the changes in liquidity tax would impact the marginal rate of substitution between uh, uh, labor and consumption from the constrained agent side. So uh, the labor hours are found to be more stable when uh, under price rule and quantity rule regime. Um, inflation, uh, again, is more stable under price rule and quantity rule regime. Um, so the secondary monetary policy instrument kind of works uh, in achieving the price stability mandate. Um, uh, and the foreign variables of uh, real exchange rate and imports are also found to be relatively more stable when CBDC interest rate is adjustable. And between price rule and quantity rule, price rule kind of performs better in terms of the variables where the uh, volatility has declined. Uh, next, uh, um, we also uh, wanted to see a situation where the mandate of the central bank is not only really for price stability, but it also wants to manage the exchange rate. So let's revisit the uh, Taylor rule under price rule regime. So price rule regime has this Taylor rule where the bond interest rate reacts to uh, inflation and the CBDC interest rate rule uh, uh, where CBDC interest rate also reacts to inflation. Now, suppose the central bank, um, they want to manage exchange rate and they use the interest rate on bonds to manage the exchange rate. So this would be the nominal depreciation uh, uh, of exchange rate and the bond interest rate reacts to this depreciation in exchange, nominal depreciation in exchange rate as well, and which is determined by the uh, coefficient here, phi i delta e. And there is a, C, uh, and central bank wants to have an expansionary monetary policy. So there is a shock to the CBDC interest rate, a positive shock. So uh, when CBDC interest rate shock, it increases, uh, people would find it attractive to hold CBDC. So, um, or um, the CBDC ratio kind of increases in the price rule regime. Uh, um, higher liquidity, uh, which would mean that people want to consume more. So there is an expansionary monetary policy uh, happening here. Um, the rise in the CBDC rate would imply that the um, spread between policy and CBDC rate would decline. Uh, the interesting point is with respect to the nominal policy rate. So under all the three regimes of 
flexible exchange rate, managed float, and fixed exchange rate. Uh, so when the central bank tries to uh, manage exchange rate through uh, the uh, bond interest rate, the nominal policy rate rises so that you know it can manage the exchange rate, and the nominal depreciation is far muted under managed float and fixed exchange rate. So these are the values of the coefficients for managed float and fixed exchange rate. So the result we find that uh, you know that there is um, when uh, uh, CBDC there is a positive CBDC interest rate shock, the central bank is able to uh, manage the domestic economy through CBDC alone, while the primary interest rate uh, on uh, interest rate on bonds is used to manage exchange rate. So this kind of relaxes the monetary policy dilemma faced by uh, small open economies. Uh, so CBDC could um, lead to a possibility that domestic issuance of CBDC could lead to a possibility that the monetary policy dilemma could be relaxed for small open economies. Um, so finally, to conclude, uh, so our motivation primarily comes from the interest regarding central banks uh, regarding issuance of domestic retail CBDC. So our question was to find the implications of issuing retail CBDC with adjustable interest rate in small open economies. Uh, and our approach, uh, we used an open economy DSG model where the central bank switched from baseline regime of fixed CBDC interest rate to uh, an adjustable CBDC interest rate regime uh, where the central bank could vary the interest rate and it's according to a price rule or quantity rule. And the results we find that uh, the parity can we develop parity conditions between CBDC and uh, other assets and for CBDs uh, uh, and for the central bank to have some autonomy over the CBDC interest rate, um, the um, competing medium of exchange, which are CBDC and deposits, they, sh they should be imperfect substitutes. And uh, we also find that CBDC price-based and quantity-based policy rules de generally deliver social welfare outcomes, uh, better social welfare outcomes than fixed interest uh, rate system on CBDC. However, there are distributional effects and uh, there are uh, the welfare outcomes are also highly conditional on the sources of uncertainties considered. Um, and domestic issuance of CBDC uh, gives the possibility that the central bank can have a domestic monetary independence while managing exchange rate through uncovered interest parity condition. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody is doing really well for time today. Um, the discussant is, uh, is Massimo. Yes, uh, uh, thanks. Uh, let me share my slides. Uh, let's, let's try to keep on the good track. Um, so okay, here's my uh, my discussion of this of this interesting paper. Um, so what's the paper about? The paper essentially, as we've just seen, is a small open economy model uh, when the domestic economy emits a CBDC, uh, which is used domestically. Uh, now the key feature of the model is that we have two uh, buckets of households. Uh, we have constrained households uh, which face quite some degree of friction when they need to acquire means of payment. And then uh, we have uh, these households that get the, uh, the CBDC, uh, which is better for them uh, because they can do more with less, essentially. So they need less instruments for that is that are extremely costly for them to invoice the same amount of payment. So this is very good news. Now, uh, what are uh, the, the main findings? Of course, we have a, a, a set of parity conditions that highlight the trade-off between the different asset classes. Uh, then we uh, we've just uh, uh, seen that a counter cyclical rule uh, improves social welfare. Uh, this comes at the cost of some uh, distributional effects that, to me, they are quite uh, sizable. And finally, uh, this actually should have been the first result because this is really, to me, the key selling point of the paper. Uh, through the CBDC rate, you can reach to some extent monetary policy autonomy and exchange rate stability. Uh, which is a kind of the holy grail of, of uh, uh, international economics. This is the most powerful result of the paper, and I think it should be the, the, uh, the main one. Now, uh, I have four comments, uh, uh, all of which uh, uh, maybe, maybe are, are not so important. Uh, uh, most of the non-important are at the end with the technical part that are just uh, uh, mostly nerdy points uh, for those who are into this literature. Uh, 
uh, but let me uh, but I will first talk about uh, uh, the characteristic of the CBDC in the model and the role of means of payment in the model. And then I have some open question on the optimal policy exercise. Now, uh, what's really about the CBDC? Uh, the CBDC in the model rests, uh, uh, as, as it is my reading, uh, on, on three assumptions. Uh, one is that only, uncon uh, only constrained households can access the CBDC, while unconstrained households cannot. And I was wondering why so, uh, because actually uh, you cannot show in the model uh, that deposits really dominate the CBDC. So the, uh, why would one, only one asset uh, class uh, hold the CBDC? And this, uh, why is this important? Well, it's probably will have something to do with welfare. No, uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, that uh, unconstrained households they are so much worse off with the CBDC is that they cannot access it. Uh, and I will come back to this uh, later. And then. What are the key characteristics of the CBDC that matter for constraint houses? Well, they're not so different from a bank deposit, except this uh, C coefficient that tell you uh, uh, that essentially you do more with less. But there is one characteristic of the of both uh, uh, CBDC and uh, deposits, which are these two elements here. I'm reporting here the first order condition of the model, uh, which tell you that uh, the demand for deposit and CBDC by constrained households, they depend on a bunch of factors, among which remuneration. But one of these factors is a sort of default risk premium. That is the key friction that households face, that the constrained households face when they want liquidity service. And, and this uh, uh, default risk premium is, is exactly the same uh, between a deposit and, and, and a CBDC. Uh, despite one could think that the two have, have a very different, uh, a very different this is also important uh, uh, because the uh, equality of these two items over here uh, is key uh, to derive, uh, uh, to simplify a lot uh, the first order condition that we, uh, that we have just seen and to get to uh, cross asset holding uh, uh, parity equation. And, 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 and this is my, 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 my main question you know, on, on why is it so, if it, if it would be somehow justified uh, a little bit. Then uh, my, my second question, which is related to the first point, is uh, what are really means of payment in the model? Uh, if I look through the uh, model's equation and I, and, I, and I search for the U, which is the amount of deposits uh, demanded by unconstrained households, uh, I cannot find it. Because this is the set of equations of uh, unconstrained uh, households. Um, and that makes me uh, wonder uh, where the U comes from in the model. And, and one, one, one answer, but this is really a, a question more than a statement because I, 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 I don't know, uh, is that it can come from the budget constraint. Uh, but then, uh, then that leads me to think that uh, uh, in the model behind the curtains, this DU uh, might act uh, as a uh, shock absorber in the sense that it adapts to shocks because it's just the residual of the budget constraint. Um, and, and I'm also wondering, um, uh, uh, why, why the deposit rate is the same across the two uh, households? Because essentially the two households, they face uh, uh, completely different uh, frictions uh, when, they, when they buy a deposit, they extract the different utilities, and this somehow should also be uh, mirrored in the, uh, in, in the deposit, uh, in the deposit rate. Um, and, and this is my open question, if, if it would be possible you know, to shed a bit of light on how the use determine. And when we look at the impulse responses, uh, we see uh, that the uh, impulse responses to a, uh, I think this is a TSP shock, uh, the impulse responses, uh, uh, they change very little when the CBDC is introduced. And much of the action you have through spread or through uh, holding of CBDC and deposit. And this kind of uh, uh, gets back us uh, back to the literature of money uh, in the utility function, which is essentially uh, how the CBDC enters uh, this model. And uh, when you have when you add money to a classic uh, closed economy model, uh, what you find is that the impact is quantitatively very small. Uh, it, it really acts at the margin. And uh, here it seems that some of the uh, aggregate uh, uh, aggregate uh, impact uh, they are more sizable for some shock, but for other shocks are uh, are quite small. And uh, uh, maybe this will change uh, if you allow for more feedbacks uh, between the foreign economy and the domestic economy, uh, for example, uh, uh, through uh, a demand of assets that would affect interest rate or exchange rate fluctuations, 
uh, or through a, a more widespread uh, use of the of the CBDC um, in the model. And, and now, finally, uh, as you as you notice, uh, uh, well, the welfare exercise has some uh, very uh, large uh, distributional effects, which lead me to think that the these unconstrained guys. Uh, they act as a shock absorber in the model when the CBDC is, uh, is introduced. And they're really worse off. They're much worse off than the constraint agents are, are better off. Uh, now, of course, we know that, uh, that uh, um, uh, you, you know, uh, welfare numbers, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, ordinary numbers, uh, but, but still, when you, when, you, when you do the averaging, uh, uh, the, the fact that you have a very positive welfare gain in the society uh, should be related to the fact that the weight of this unconstrained outreach is very low. Um, how much law uh, is too much law in this model? Uh, this is an open question because there is no one-to-one uh, -one mapping of, uh, of these numbers to, 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 to real data. But just to put it into perspective, if you go uh, the OECD has some statistics uh, on the access uh, to finance in, uh, in different advanced emerging market economy. And if you look at New Zealand, uh, you find that almost all households have banks accounts, and uh, a very large fraction of households is, con is considered to be finance uh, uh, included. So the question is, how much would this change, or in which direction? I think because it's uncontroversial that uh, you know it's a calibration choice, so if you change omega, uh, it will change also the result. But the really interesting bit here is, uh, would the direction of this result change uh, in some uh, uh, Meaningful way, uh, so that uh, you know you can play, you can you can play it uh, a nice, uh, a probably a, a nice and more general uh, results of your model that can be applied both to countries where uh, a lot of households are financially constrained and to countries where uh, a lot of households are financially unconstrained, and play a little bit uh, with the differences in the impact of the CBDC uh, depending on financial inclusion, which is actually uh, one of the key, uh, you know. Uh, policy uh, deliverable of, of a CBDC, so to foster financial inclusion. And I think it would be super interesting to understand uh, how much this uh, uh, would, uh, would play uh, out uh, in a world where, uh, in advanced economy, where a lot of people are already financially included, and in a uh, relative to a, 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 a emerging market economy. Uh, and now let me just read through uh, my, my, my technical points that are, uh, you know, more nerdy question than others, so uh, take me a bit grown of salt here. Uh, first of all, uh, as a first reading of your paper, it seems that you estimate the model with the CBDC, but this is clearly not possible and I don't think uh, it's what you have done. Uh, so I will probably um, stress a little bit more because of course, you know, we know that the model with the CBDC is, there, is for sure the wrong data generating process because there is no CBDC out there at all. Um, and finally, I, I stumbled upon one result that I found interesting and, and it might be uh, delivered might deserve, uh, sorry, uh, a bit more of, uh, um, of, uh, of, uh, of explanation is that when you have a, an interest rate, rate hike on the CBDC rate, um, you have consumption that increases. And I think this is uh, something to do, uh, to my understanding of the model, it's something to do uh, with the with substitution and liquidity services provided by the CBDC, uh, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, maybe uh, if, you can, if, you can, if you have some idea already uh, on this result. It would be cool. Otherwise, uh, I look forward, to, you know, maybe maybe an, a, a future presentation. And and, and finally, uh, just to notice, uh, uh, your optimization of welfare ends up in a in a corner solution. And um, and this is of course, you know, not so nice. Uh, um, as I as I said uh, in, in my in my talk uh, before, uh, maybe you can try some uh, Newton-based algorithm. There are thousands out there uh, that that are really efficient and really fast. Um, and the model uh, from my knowledge of this model and my reading of your paper doesn't seem so large uh, such to prevent the use of such algor algorithm maybe i'm wrong and another thing you might want to do uh, that probably will help out uh, unconstrained household is to jointly optimize uh, all parameters in the policy function so the taylor rule parameters uh, taylor rule of bonds and the cbdc parameter and this might you know help out a little bit uh, the uh, the unconstrained household, even if I think that given their weight is so limited uh, in the overall welfare, uh, they are just washed out uh, for them. Um, and finally, um, one, one thing that I would add if I were writing the paper, but again, these are uh, just uh, tiny details that I would spend more time or a bit of time uh, 
looking into if there are any uh, welfare cost of exchange rate stabilization because we have this result that is so uh, relevant and so powerful that uh, probably uh, would deserve uh, a, a, a little bit more. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, these are, uh, are again my my conclusion, um, and this is all of for my discussion. And I will leave the floor to question now. Uh, if there are. Yeah, I think you th thank you very much. Uh, very good. And I think you had so much material there that it's best if Amu uh, responds to that first again before we go to the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Massimo, for the very interesting questions. Um, so you had a question between the parity condition between the um, deposit rate and CBDC rate, and there's a risk premium uh, component there, which uh, which is very similar for both the uh, first order conditions with respect to uh, CBDC and uh, deposits. Uh, that risk premium coefficient arises through the uh, fact that um, the constrained agents have access to loans. So they have uh, to give collateral and that collateral comprises of deposits and CBDC. So that um, for simplification, like when we generated the parity condition, so it kind of cancels out. And uh, the difference is entirely driven by the marginal cost associated with using one medium of exchange over the other. So that is on the, uh, the parity between the CBDC and deposit rates. Then, um, uh, okay, so why deposits, uh, why do um, unconstrained agents do not, they hold, uh, they do not hold CBDC. So um, again, uh, I'm referring back to um, uh, Badir and Kumhoff's paper. So they introduced uh, financial investors so that they can get a, a kind of a interest rate uh, condition between bond interest rate and deposit interest rate. So we also, the argument for introducing unconstrained agent arises simply from the same context as well. So from uh, bond interest rate to deposit interest rate uh, in among the unconstrained agents and from the constrained agents, it would be from deposit rate to CBDC rate. So there is a, a, a flow in terms of the interest parity differential. In then, addition, if, I, if, I, if I may say something there, uh, sure. we did, uh, at the beginning of our work on that 2016 paper, we did introduce our uh, uh, CBDC into financial investor utility function as well, but it was driven to a corner solution of zero. Uh, the reason for that is that the CBDC interest rate in equilibrium is substantially below uh, the interest rate on deposits and financial investors have a very high interest sensitivity. Uh, so that means that basically the CBDC gets crowded out. Yes, I mean, yes, uh, that uh, was the argument given in the paper as well, I remember reading it. Uh, then with respect to the sensitivity of Omega, yes, I do understand Omega value is very small. Uh, so finance, uh, the unconstrained agents in our model only comprise 5% of the population or 5% of the agents uh, in the household. Uh, so uh, varying the level of Omega and seeing the welfare, uh, you know, a distribution while varying the value of Omega would be an interesting uh, point of consideration. I think we can actually do that for our paper. Um, and to see as to whether, you know, uh, is there a point where both of them are better off or is it the case that always the financial invest, uh, the unconstrained agents are worse off. So that is uh, an interesting point to consider. Uh, then um, estimating CBDC. So our baseline model uh, is on fixed CBDC interest rate system. So we uh, assume that uh, it is analogous to cash, right? So cash has a fixed interest rate of zero. So um, uh, CBDC earning a fixed interest rate, uh, we, uh, I mean, we kind of assume that it is very analogous to cash. So uh, estimating the model with uh, CBDC, you know, we, we consider uh, the uh, monetary um, liquidity aggregate from New Zealand data to get the value of LT, which comprise both of deposits and cash in the baseline situation. So uh, that is an assumption that we make. Uh, then with respect to optimization, uh, we follow simple grid searches. It just in terms of increments of uh, 0.1, it's not uh, very, uh, I understand your point regarding, you know, why it could be a corner solution and uh, we should have followed a more uh, robust algorithm, but then um, we, our model is simple. So we kind of have uh, uh, limited ourselves to a grid search um, kind of uh, method here. Then the welfare cost to exchange rate stabilization is a very interesting point. I think that is something that uh, we would be considering. And, and 
uh, maybe a separate paper altogether. Uh, so um, we are working on that angle as well. Um, so I think that would be it from my part. Uh, I, have I answered? Yeah. I, I have one more question if the audience yes. is not scrolling. Um, can, can we perhaps postpone this until the end? Because uh, we, we've had such a long and rich discussion that now we exhausted all the time that we earlier uh, gained. Uh, and uh, Andre needs to have enough time uh, for his presentation. So I would like to hand over to Andre now and come back to that question if we have time at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. So it's uh, great to be here. This is one of my favorite conferences, so happy to have a new paper to present. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is joint work with Michael, Marco Pinchetti, also at the BOE, and Polichairong Charanki School from the BIS. So the usual disclaimer applies to all of us. And as Michael said, this is very much still working in progress, even the title is still provisional, but uh, we did think that we have enough interesting material to show, uh, to, uh, you know, to make it worthwhile to participate to this session. Um, so I guess I'm pr mostly preaching to converts here, but let's just briefly, you know, review how we think about CBDC, and a lot of this has been said already. So it is like cash and reserves part of the liability side of a central bank's balance sheet. That's how we would tend to, uh, to think about central bank digital currency. It is a form of digital money. And there is this element of you know, greater financial inclusion because um, more agents would be able to uh, uh, access the central bank's balance sheet and not limiting that anymore to just banks. So it's very much the uh, uh, retail CBDC view uh, that we take here, as has as been, uh, you know, the coined by the BIS in, in, in the 2020 publications. And when we think about CBDCs, of course, we think of many potential benefits, which are, you know, include financial inclusion, a lowering of transaction costs, fostering further innovation some efficient macroeconomic efficiency gain and even stabilization gains because you gain another policy instrument and the same is true for financial stability. But of course, with that can come potential risks such as tax avoidance, central banks worry about potential loss of oversight, especially if the CBDC is also uh, traded outside of their jurisdiction. There's concern about potential volatility of capital flows of the exchange rate, etc. So that's really just to set the scene. And then on top of that, there is the international dimension that's uh, interesting uh, uh, here in this context. So there is the idea that CBDC should facilitate cross-border payments and improve efficiency. So sort of uh, open economy extensions of the closed economy benefits. But there is a worry that this could come at the cost of greater uh, financial instability. And in particular, I will show you a picture in, in the next slide from a survey of central banks where this has come uh, out as one of the concerns that uh, central banks have. Moreover, there are several institutions that are actively exploring you know, multi-CBDC arrangements. And oh, as also Massimo mentioned, you know, it is kind of interesting to start thinking about these uh, you know, policy games where, where you start thinking about you know, who introduces a CBDC, when, how, how do, what kind of policy rule you use for it. So it's sort of porting the literature on, on you know, monetary policy coordination to this additional dimension. So it's very important to understand the macroeconomic implication of such arrangements, and we hope to provide a framework that uh, helps towards that. So these are just two pictures that I wanted to show you very briefly. One is about the, poten the picture on the left that's taken from The Economist, and that's about the potential benefits from uh, you know, introducing CBDC. So this is just giving you an estimate of the costs of uh, sending remittances. So obviously, you know, if you send remittances using bank transfers, that's more expensive than if you use, say, uh, uh, Western Union, and that's at, in turn more expensive than if you use something like, uh, you know, Word Remit or TransferWise. And then there is the hope that uh, were CBDC to be introduced, these costs could, uh, you know, 
fall, fall further. That's just one example. Whereas here on the right, this is taken from the BIS annual report, which quoted this uh, survey from uh, uh, Raphael Auer uh, and co-authors from 2021. And as I already said, one of the uh, areas of concern cited by uh, central banks is the notion that there could be undesirable volatility in exchange rate and you know, by implications in uh, capital flows. So uh, when we approached uh, this project, so we started thinking about some of the modeling challenges in modeling retail CBDCs. And uh, uh, here I've list, uh, listed them. So the first uh, thing that one needs to carefully think about is that you know, CBDC is a digital asset, so it's going to compete with other digital assets. And that, uh, in our view, means primarily bank deposits and government bonds. Okay, and in fact, not primarily cash. So I guess this is a you know a, a difference in religious faith to the to the Ferrari paper. It's something that that we we should keep talking about. But I mean, this is our view that it's mainly a digital asset, and so it should you know mostly compete with other digital assets, or if you like, find other financial assets, and not primarily cash. Then you need to motivate demand. So you sort of need to explain why a CBDC would be different than these other assets. So if you want to talk about cash, obviously the most uh, strike, uh, prominent difference is that it's interest bearing. Unlike central bank reserves, it is held by the, it would be held by the general public. And unlike bonds, it uh, would provide also liquidity services. And typically, you know, I, I mean, there are some cases where bonds can be used to settle transactions, but they are not really, really relevant. And they don't. they're more the exception that proves the rule. Another thing that we uh, want to highlight is if you want to think seriously about CBDC, you really do need to think about the public sector balance sheet. So that's the government and the central bank. I mean, the central bank is an obvious one because it, it, it would be the issuer of, uh, of CBDC. But the government is also important because, you know, if CBDCs are to be backed by government bonds, then you need to meaningfully model, model the evolution of government debt and what changes to that uh, stock. Uh, imply for then other variables such as taxes, etc. And finally, this has you know uh, already become obvious from the previous presentations. There are many options uh, in terms of design, in terms of implementation. You can uh, introduce them in one country, in both countries, etc., uh, etc. Et so actually, this is one of those cases where having a rich and flexible framework is a sort of good. So having a bigger model is actually an advantage rather than. Yeah, yeah, at disadvantage. So, where do we stand relative to the uh, literature? I mean, you can think of our model as essentially an open economy extension of Bardi uh, and simplification of Bardi or Kumhof, or you can think of it as an extension with CBDC of our earlier paper uh, on, on gross capital flows. So. Why is it important to think about gross capital flows? Because in this uh, in this paper with Purichai and Michael, we argue that to think about many uh, uh, you know, policy relevant debates in international macro and finance, you really need to think about uh, gross uh, capital flows rather than net capital flows. And introducing CBDCs, just introducing a, a further set of gross assets uh, to, uh, into the mix. So essentially, you, you really need uh, you're better off having a framework that allows to model those. Then, of course, we have already said that this is a, uh, as of now, it is a niche, uh, the open economy uh, dimension of CBDCs, but it's a grow, uh, fast growing niche of papers. Uh, relative to the main existing papers, I have highlighted here the, the, the main differences of our framework. I mean, if you look at, Beni, the, uh, at Benigno et al., which is one paper that hasn't been mentioned earlier today, but it is kind of sort of relevant. Our paper is explicitly about CBDCs and not just about digital currencies. And it's also a rich model uh, that you can use for policy experiments rather than a stylized model that you use to make uh, a theoretical point. Uh, the key difference that I, that I would highlight with uh, Massimo's paper that was presented earlier is that, we're main, that our CBDC are mainly competing with bank deposits and not with cash. The other big difference, of course, is that Massimo's paper is also a net flow model. Ours is a gross flow model. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, finally, uh, one difference, one important difference uh, relative to the George et al. paper is that we explicitly also consider transitions from CBDC to uh, pre-CBDC to CBDC economies, as in the Bardier and Kumov uh, 2021 paper. This is just to give you the context. And this is a, a, a preview of the results that I'm going to show you today after telling you about the model. So I'm going to show you a transition simulation where CBDC uh, is introduced in one country only. And then I'm going to show you how that leads to higher output, lower interest rates, uh, uh, you know, a depreciation in a current account surplus. I'll talk about the mechanisms, but essentially you'll see a transition simulation. And then you'll also see a shock simulation in a CBDC economy. Uh, and we'll look at what happens if uh, in the economy that hasn't issued uh, CBDCs, agents uh, suddenly uh, decide they want to hold more liquidity denominated in uh, home currency. So when they want to hold both more deposits and more CBDCs denominated in the uh, home currency. And we will see that this is mostly a financial shock that has uh, implications for uh, uh, balance sheets. But apart from the exchange rate, it will not really have real effect. So this speaks a little bit to, 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 to the question whether you know, uh, CBDCs necessarily induce uh, greater uh, ma ma macroeconomic instability. And for this particular shock in this particular setup, we we'll see that that's not the case. And that uh, apart from the exchange rate, not much happens on, uh, you know, to standard macro variables. So let me go to the model. So the, uh, before CBDCs are introduced, the model is essentially our um, uh, 2020 model with Michael and Puri Chai, uh, with, in addition, capital accumulation and a fiscal sector. We have capital accumulation because uh, investment is an important uh, variable through which uh, you know, shocks propagate in, in this framework. And we need a fiscal sector because we need to meaningfully uh, uh, model the government budget constraint and uh, uh, and debt issuance. So it is a two country New Keynesian DSG model with bank financing. So we have banks that issue loans and uh, thereby creating deposits. Deposit creation is limited by, uh, you know, all, uh, a, set, uh, a set of constraints. These include the regulations such as Basel and uh, other constraints on balance sheet. And uh, liquidity is important in this model because it lowers transaction costs. And this is also a model uh, that features gross cross-border positions. So uh, all the banking in one currency happens in one country, but uh, agents in each country demand uh, liquidity denominated in both currencies. And there is settlement of uh, all the gross transactions that that uh, entails through uh, interbank accounts. And the model is calibrated. It is calibrated very carefully, mostly on US data, and it's a fairly large model to uh, allow you meaningful policy experiments. And once you start adding, uh, adding CBDCs to the model, then there's some features that are just an uh, you know, open economy tr uh, translation of, uh, of, of what happens in Bardier and Kumhoff. So we have retail CBDCs issued by the central bank against government bonds. So uh, unlike Massimo's paper, the swap here is not, uh, you know, you bring cash to the central bank and get CBDCs instead. What you have to do is you have to post uh, government bonds as collateral and that, uh, uh, and in, in exchange for that, you, you, you get a CBDC. One of the key channels through which, uh, you know, this CBDC issuance affects uh, uh, the steady state is the reduction in, in the stock of defaultable government debt held by the private sector, because essentially some of the government debt ends up on the bank, uh, on the central bank's balance sheet, and therefore the consolidated government plus central bank balance sheet uh, features a, a reduced uh, uh, stock of debt. Of course, you have potentially two more cross-border assets. Uh, two, if you, if both countries issue CBDC, one in the in the simulations that I will show you today, and CBDCs will be imperfect substitutes for bank deposits in the same currency. So basically, they will be you know, competing, but imperfectly competing with uh, bank deposits uh, in in the same currency. And what will matter for the monetary friction will be. Uh, the overall uh, quantity of liquidity present in the economy, which will be 
uh, both deposits and CBDC uh, deno uh, denominated in both home and foreign currency. I need to tell you a little bit more about the financial sector. So there's two main agents uh, that you can think of as uh, representing the uh, financial sector in each country. One is banks and the other is financial investors that we already talked uh, uh, about a little bit. So banks uh, do three main things. And, uh, you know, for exposition uh, purposes, we split them in three different sectors, but it's really just uh, one banking sector. And, and these three things are uh, picking the size and composition of, uh, of their balance sheet uh, in order to maximize profit subject to a number of constraints. And these constraints are uh, your Basel regulation, which limits your credit, cre uh, credit creation. There is a constraint that says that banks should not be uh, mis uh, should not have foreign exchange uh, foreign currency mismatches on their balance sheet. And finally, there is a, a there is a friction that induces banks to uh, hold uh, liquidity in the in, in the other denominated in the other countries uh, currency for precautionary reasons to 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 avoid uh, potential bank runs. The other two things that banks do is set terms of the, uh, retail deposit and loan contracts. Deposits is very simple. It's just a markdown on the wholesale deposit rate, whereas for loans, the pricing of retail loans reflects default risk, just, in, just, in, uh, just as in BGG. Whereas financial investors, which we already talked about in, uh, in the previous presentation, you can think of them as the domestic wholesale uh, uh, money market, so these are agents who hold the stock of government debt, and they're also the marginal source of funding on, uh, on the wholesale deposit market. And, uh, and as Amos mentioned, uh, what that means is that they introduce an arbitrage condition between the risk-free rate and the wholesale deposit rate. But these agents are also important because they facilitate the acquisition of uh, CBDC on the part of households. So you can also think of them as some sort of broker, because basically when households want to acquire CBDC, they have to Obviously, they have to swap them for deposits, but they have to somehow through go, uh, somehow go through an agent that holds government bonds because that agent needs to post that uh, with the with the central bank. And these uh, and and these financial investors perform that uh, that function. So, just to make things a bit clearer, I have drawn some balance sheets here to make you understand how uh, the mechanics of CBDC introduction work. So this is the economy. Uh, without CBDC showing just the relevant balance sheet items. So the government issues a certain amount of government debt. Uh, that government debt is exclusively held by financial investors. On the other hand, the only liquid asset in the pre-CBDC economy are retail deposits, which are uh, a liability of retail banks that, uh, that finances wholesale deposits uh, in retail banks. And that liquidity, of course, is held uh, by households uh, as an asset. So once you introduce CBDC, so there is a CBDC issued by the central bank uh, against government bond. And this is what, why the consolidated balance sheet is important, because you can see that the net uh, of, of these two, two items here is a, is a lower stock of gov a default of a government bond on the liability side. And of course, on top of that, there's the CBDC item. The CBD, CBDC item ended up on the, household, uh, on the household's balance sheet, but it really went through uh, a transaction with the financial investors who basically you know, uh, posted some of those uh, bonds that they held to the central bank, got the CBDCs in return, and they sold CBDCs to the households in exchange for some retail deposits financial investors, then this is just a feature of our model, would then you know, get rid of those retail deposits and turn them into wholesale deposits, uh, which, which is what happens here. So basically, their balance sheet size is unchanged, but their composition is unchanged. And this is also what happens uh, essentially in, in, our, in the simulation that I will uh, show you in a, in a minute. Uh, on top of that, there will then, of course, be general equilibrium effects that I can't uh, show you in this picture, but this gives you uh, the gist of how the CBDC introduction works when it's a one-off permanent uh, introduction of CBDC into the, into the economy. So very briefly, what you need to know about uh, uh, the household's optimization problems. 
problem. So households have to optimize over a lot of things. So they, you know, the standard items would be consumption, hours work, uh, investment and uh, uh, capital holdings. Then they have a, a portfolio problem, which, uh, which is to determine their holdings of uh, the various uh, types of liquid assets uh, at their disposal, which are home and foreign currency deposits. And once they're CBDC, home and foreign currency uh, CBDC. So we have a two level, uh, um, you know, we have two, two levels of liquidity aggregators. We have a top level liquidity aggregator that uh, aggregates, you know, a, 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 a liquidity aggregate uh, in domestic currency and a liquidity aggregate in foreign currency, which in turn are a composite of uh, deposits in uh, each currency and uh, CBDC in each currency. And there is uh, also this term here, which sort of captures the technological advantage of uh, CBDC with respect to uh, to deposits, in order to make them, uh, you know, slightly slightly different uh, slightly different liquid assets. Uh, this setup, like in uh, our other models, uh, uh, our previous you have models, 10 minutes, models. Andre. yeah, thank you. Uh, entail systematic deviations from UI, uh, from uncovered interest parity because there is convenience yield dynamics. So because uh, uh, the, the liquid assets in different currencies are imperfect substitutes, once you change the relative demand or the relative supplies, you uh, end up having uh, effects on the exchange. And the last thing households optimize on, uh, uh, they basically have, have uh, optimality conditions on, on, on their loans in both currencies and also on the bankruptcy cutoff conditions like in, like in BGG. That's not particularly interesting in, uh, in this setup. As for the other agents in the model, so monetary policy is very standard. There is, a, there is just a Taylor rule. The one thing that's worth mentioning is that in the transition simulation, the equilibrium interest rate also reflects changes in the steady state debt to GDP ratio. That's sort of to capture a feature of, of, of the data. Once they're introduced, CBDC are governed by a quantity rule. Uh, we haven't tried interest rate rules yet, but I mean, that's easy to do once, uh, once we have this. Fiscal policy is... Uh, standard. So we have a, a, obviously a, a government budget constraint with a standard rule for government spending that endogenize uh, the labor uh, tax rate and the other uh, tax rates that we have, which are on capital and consumption. We just assume that they move in proportion with the, with, with the labor tax rate. And then we have, of course, manufacturers and unions. So we have uh, price Phillips curves and wage Phillips curves. So let me move on to the simulations. So the first thing that I'm going to show you is a, a transition to a CBDC economy where one country issues CBDCs worth 30% uh, of GDP. So the first thing that that does is to lower the stock of default for government debt held by the private sector. And you have a series of effects that I, you know, I call here like closed economy effects. So they're uh, the effects that uh, uh, feature already in Bardier and Kumhoff. So you have a lower real interest rate, you have a, a, a lower distortionary taxes because uh, the government has to uh, you know, service a, a lower level of government debt. And more, moreover, you have more abundant liquidity, which lower, uh, lowers uh, transaction costs and therefore boosts activity. On top of these three, in an open economy, you also have an additional uh, effect on the real exchange rate. Uh, if the issuance happen if the issuance happens only in one country or is otherwise asymmetrical, of course, and that's because if there's excess supply of uh, domestic uh, currency in this case, because uh, the issuance of CBDC is essentially you know in increasing the stock of uh, liquid assets denominated in uh, one currency, you in equilibrium also have an effect on the real exchange rate, which in turn pushes uh, uh, as a as an impact on the current account. Okay, so uh, now I'll, I'll show you in pictures what I've just said in words. So I have two panels to show you. So here is the uh, uh, liquidity injection, 30% of GDP. Here's the effect on the government uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio he uh, held by the private sector. Here is the uh, effect on the lower, lower uh, on the real interest rate, which is about, uh, about 60 uh, basis points, and then. Ultimately, what that will result 
into is higher demand uh, and uh, also high, uh, higher level of loans in the economy. But you can't really understand these two panels before I show you the other panels. And here's where the GDP effects mainly come from. So there is a reduction in, uh, in all tax rate, but uh, here I uh, just plotted the capital tax rate uh, that boosts investment. Of course, you will have also lower consumption taxes, which will uh, boost consumption and lower labor taxes that will do the same thing. We have lower monetary transaction costs because we have this injection of additional liquid assets that, in, that also boosts consum uh, consumption because the, the friction, uh, uh, monetary friction operates in the model. And on top of that, we have this effect on the real exchange rate. So we have a, a depreciation of a, a, a slightly above 1% relative to the previous steady state, and that entails uh, that the steady state current account uh, to GDP ratio also improves uh, slightly. Whereas in the four panels here on the right, I'm just showing you essentially what I've shown you with the balance sheet, uh, namely the swap of uh, uh, deposits, so of, uh, uh, of bank deposits for CBDCs, which happens uh, both on uh, uh, domestic households and foreign households balance sheet, right? So these these items essent, uh, are essentially almost uh, are almost uh, identical in size, bar from some of the general equilibrium effects that I was not able to capture before. Okay, uh, last few minutes, I also show you a shock simulation, and here the shock is uh, a flight to domestic currency. So this is essentially an exogenous shift in uh, foreign household portfolio preferences over uh, assets, the liquid assets denominated in uh, uh, foreign or domestic currency. So it's a shock to the financial home bias, if, uh, which I've highlighted here in red. So the main financial effects of this shock is just a reallocation of liquidity, which is really what, what these households want. So, the, uh, so they just want to hold more liquid assets denominated in home currency uh, rather than foreign currency, and these will be spread between both deposits and CPTCs. Of course, in general equilibrium, this has to be accommodated by uh, households in the other country, uh, which, uh, which they do once the exchange rate uh, appreciates. And the logic of why the exchange rate uh, appreciate is because there is an excess demand for uh, home currency because of this uh, shift in preferences, which leads to an appreciation. But you will also see that the shock actually has very small real effects uh, in the home country. So it's really mainly a, a, a financial shock. And it also sp speaks to this idea that you know some financial shocks might not really be so uh, detrimental to the real economy, even once you introduce another asset that can be potentially traded internationally, and therefore you know prima facie also uh, inducing more uh, volatility in the economy. So here this is a bit messy. Sorry. Uh, here are the balance sheet. So you see that. Foreign households want to acquire domestic liquidity, so deposits and CBDC. So they have to essentially shed some of their uh, liquidity uh, denominated in foreign currency. So that's foreign deposits here and um, foreign CBDC and acquire instead uh, domestic currency CBDC and domestic currency deposits. Uh, of course, domestic households have to do the opposite. So they uh, will tend to sell their, uh, both their deposits denominated in domestic currency and their uh, CBDC to, uh, to foreign households and instead acquire uh, uh, deposits denominated in foreign currency and CBDC denominated in foreign currency. Uh, interestingly, what happens, uh, uh, what also happens is that foreign households uh, uh, as part of this adjustment also deleverage, so they also repay some of their loans, uh, both in foreign uh, currency and home currency. Whereas what, uh, what domestic households do in equilibrium is they actually borrow some additional uh, liquidity from a home and foreign banks and actually sell it to the foreign households. And the exchange rate is what uh, sort of makes all, all of this uh, 
possible, among other things. I'm not showing you the, the interest rates, but the exchange rate is one important price in making this adjustment possible. So we do have a big uh, appreciation of the, uh, of the real exchange rate. But other than that, there's not really much going on in the domestic currency. So the GDP effects, if you look at the scales, are tiny. Uh, inflation effects via the Phillips curves are also tiny. It's mostly through, the, through, a, through a small effect due to the exchange rate. And this thing on the current account is actually uh, a wrinkle in the, uh, in the reporting variable that we have in the model. So it's not really happening. So even the current account is very small in the simulation. So overall, this is a you know, big financial shock, but a small real shock from the point of view of the domestic economy. So let me stop there. I'll just leave you with the key messages here. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think we have about uh, 20 seconds. If somebody can get in a question in that time. I have, I have two questions. Uh, one from me and, and one from Cedric Thiel that I think he cannot uh, activate his microphone because he's attendee. Uh, so uh, he's asking uh, how this is different from uh, monetization of government debt. And, and I put my, my question as follows because it's very similar actually. And it seems to me that the main engine, uh, technically, in this model uh, is that, that the CBDC is actually very similar of, of a quantitative easing. If I had to, to write a model with quantitative easing, I would do something very similar, and the restriction and the impact on the economy would be uh, fairly, uh, you know, would be something like that. No, you have, uh, you have the central bank that, that buys bonds, and then through the buying of bonds, you have all the effects on the financial sector and then the real economy. And, and I was wondering, uh, and this is really open question, no? um, I'm not saying that there is, uh, I mean, no one says how this thing would be, would be done actually in concrete. No? Um, uh, what, we can look at the experiments. Uh, actually, I, I think that some of the experiments, I'm thinking at the Chinese, for example, they are not asking to collateralize the CBDC with bonds. Uh, I think they're they are really asking for cash for the CBDC in the experiment they're doing in uh, in Shenzhen, uh, I believe. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, depending on how you do the CBDC, uh, it will be very, uh, it will be very different. Uh, uh, because this, uh, this effect you find, uh, I, I'm wondering if they're really tied to the fact that you have uh, this uh, reduction in the circulation of bonds, uh, and then you have, you know, all these effects that are very similar to quantitative easing. Um, but then, uh, you know, politically, I, I don't know how many how many governments or central banks would be willing to, to start such such endeavor uh, in the in the long term. Uh, but you know, I, I would love to have your your views, but I think we're out of time. Uh, anyway, so, just, Andre, if you don't mind, could I quickly answer try and answer that question? Uh, which one? Because there's the one on monetization and one on QE. Because on QE, I just wanted to say, like, the big difference is that QE would have to go through banks, whereas we're Kind of, you know, this is going. This is an injection of liquidity that goes directly to households. So that would be one difference that comes to my mind. But uh, I'll, Michael seems to be keen to. Yeah, no, this this is this is absolutely right. This is absolutely critical. This is uh, QE for the people kind of thing, uh, and uh, that's completely different because if you put QE into bank reserves, you still depend on the banks to want to create additional liquidity on the basis. Of, uh, of that of those reserves and uh, there is no deposit multiplier so to expect that by increasing reserves they're going to increase deposit creation is uh, is a hope uh, but not a mechanism and and uh, uh, deposit multiplier mechanism just basically doesn't exist so uh, also if you in an industrialized economy you want to issue significant quantities of CBdc and you want to do so, quickly and on a scale of bank deposits, which are 100% to 200% of GDP, uh, you're going to have to do it against government bonds uh, because cash is something like, you know, two, three, four, five percent of GDP. It's just no comparison. You, you can you can do the, the sort of seed experiments that the Chinese are doing uh, against cash. But once you go to scale, you're going to have to do it against government bonds. And I think uh, I think we are out of out of time. Um, it was a fun session. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, everyone, very much for your participation. Uh, and I think we'll study each other's papers for some time to come. And I hope we see soon uh, 
uh, in, in our conferences like this. I, w- I would miss uh, the chat after the session. You, sir, you I, I'm, I'm missing the chat after the session that would have been possible in normal. Uh, in normal yeah, 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 very much, very much. I agree with you. Yeah. But uh, Thank- if, you, if you're keen on that chat among all of us here, uh, you can always invite us all to a Zoom call. Right? I mean, uh, this, why not? Why, yeah. Why, I mean, if you if you're keen, I think it might actually be very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 I'll try to arrange with other people uh, in my group that are studying this stuff. Uh, maybe after summer, what? But we do. Would yeah. be nice. Looking That'd forward to. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.